Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute. My name is Michael Le Chevalier. It's a real pleasure to invite you back here to our summer web lecture series on reason and beauty in Renaissance Christian thought and culture. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, this whole series is made possible out of a collaboration between the Lumen Christi Institute and the American Cusano Society. Um, and since we are featuring tonight um, the up and coming president of the Cusano Society towards the end of the event, you'll have a little opportunity to learn more about them. Um, before turning to our speaker, I wanted to um, make mention of some of the upcoming events that we are hosting at the Lumen Christi Institute. Tomorrow at 12 p.m., uh, we are hosting paleontologist Simon Conway Morris for an event on what evolution does and does not tell us about humans. Uh, this is the concluding uh, uh, lecture event that we have for our John Templeton grant funded series on science and religion. Um, it, it's an exciting event and I hope that you can join us then. And we'll also be continuing our series next week uh, on reason and beauty in the Renaissance. Uh, with Denis Robichaud uh, presenting on Marcelo Ficino and the philosophy of Plato. Um, so that'll be at 7 p.m. next week, Tuesday, same time, same place right here. Um, if you're interested in supporting our work, particularly uh, if you've enjoyed uh, web lectures like this and our webinars, uh, you can donate today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Another way that you can support us is by helping to get word out about these events. Um, we rely uh, quite a bit on the word of mouth of others. Um, and so many of you have answered on your surveys that you would recommend our events to others. So we would invite you to do so. And you can do so through any different social media means. We are on Twitter, uh, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, we're in LinkedIn. Um, and all of these, uh, um, webinars not only are recreated later as uh, videos that you can watch on YouTube, but also as podcasts. Um, so you can take reason and beauty in the Renaissance with you wherever you go. Um, before turning to our speaker, I, I will also call attention to the fact that at the end of the event, um, towards the end of the event, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. Um, if you're joining us by YouTube, you can um, simply email us at info at with your question. Um, if you're joining us by Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to pose a question at any time, and I'll return at the end of the event um, to uh, pose those questions to our speaker. Um, now, we are lucky tonight to be having a real expert uh, in today's topic. Il Kim is Associate Professor in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape um, over at Auburn University, um, and Professor Kim specializes in Italian Renaissance architecture and philosophy in Japanese modern architecture. He received his PhD in art history from Columbia University and his master's of architecture degree from Tokyo National University of Fine Arts and Music. It's rare that we are able to bring someone who um, brings this hum wide ranging humanistic interest um, and who's able to help us dig deeper, not only into sort of philosophical thought, uh, but into to see behind some of the buildings that we have behind us and all the more fitting that he's presenting on a humanist himself. So please join me um, in welcoming Professor Kim um, to our platform today. Um, Professor Kim, I invite you to unmute yourself and um, take it from here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Hi. Um, hi, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Il Kim, uh, president of the American Kazan Society. We are co-sponsoring with the Lumen, Lumen Christi Institute uh, this new webinar series, uh, Reason and Beauty in the Renaissance. A week ago, Professor Alexander and Professor Saber started the series with the elaborately delivered lecture on Dante. Our subject this evening is Leon Battista Alberti, a Renaissance man who excelled in almost every field as he himself proclaimed in his autobiography. He was a theoretician, athlete, mathematician, linguist, historian, painter, sculptor, engineer, uh, cryptographer, and an architect. In addition, he was trained as a canon lawyer and his official title was papal secretary. 
uh, abbreviatore apostolico at the papal chancery. During the day, Alberti wrote papal ordinances and bulls. That was his day job. Alberti was never officially trained as an architect, but he started developing his interest in architecture at the age of about 34 and quickly learned. Yet, Alberti's major architecture design career did not even start until he was in his mid 40s. As a scholar, I am interested in comparing Kazanus and Alberti because although Kazanus is a theologian philosopher and Alberti rejects to discuss metaphysics, therefore both look so different. But I find them that actually their goals are the same searching truth, which Kazan's tried to reach through metaphysical speculation and Alberti through purely empirical knowledge. I hope I can show Alberti's path clearly this evening and his path was a combination of rhetoric, liberal art, which is a noble art and engineering or architecture, which is mechanical art, in a way, low-class art. So Alberti combined this high and low. Today, I will give a talk on Alberti's architecture, both his theory and practice, which are not always in sync. But before that, it is useful to look at his life, his contemporary times, and even his non-architecture writings quickly. Because for Alberti, architecture was the art that encompassed all human knowledge. So I will share my video. Sorry. Okay, so this is the image of the um, of the Santa Maria Novella, uh, one of the most celebrated uh, facade design uh, in uh, European architecture history. Okay, so I will divide today uh, this talk uh, into three folds. First, life and historical context. Hold on. And second, Dere Adificatoria, his architecture treatises, and third, his building projects. So this is the bronze medal he designed um, and he, he himself cast. Uh, it was created at the time, uh, not many people were uh, into the casting. So uh, he was never trained professionally, but uh, he was you know, kind of uh, discussing the techniques with uh, artisans and he himself cast this. Okay, so first his life. And uh, I divided his life into uh, four uh, periods. First is for, from 1404 to 1428. And second is for, from 1428 to late 1430s. Uh, at the first period, he learned about uh, rhetoric. And in the second period from 1428 until 1430s, he developed his knowledge of mechanical arts. And the third period is from 1438 to 1447, during which he investigated history and design of ancient cities and buildings. And fourth period, the last one, is from 1447 to 1472, during which he mainly focused on architecture, both theory and practice. Okay, so Alberti was born um, out of wedlock in 1404. The Alberti family was a very, very powerful clan. And um, they moved uh, from the south of Florence uh, near Arezzo to the city of Florence uh, in uh, the 13th century. 
and through trade uh, uh, with uh, so many agents all over Europe and, and even Syria, Greek, Greece and Syria, they accumulated wealth. And at some point they were really, really too strong, too powerful, too potent. So uh, people, uh, citizens of Florence felt threatened. So often they thought that the Alberti clan was um, rebellious because of their wealth, you know, they didn't have no, uh, any fear, you know, toward his enemy, uh, their enemy families. So um, often uh, the, the government tried to um, get rid of them, um, kind of, a, they, they wanted to expel, expel or exile uh, Alberti clan uh, from Florence. And finally, the government became successful in 1401. All men of the Alberti family, uh, above 16 years old, have to leave the city. Women could stay, and boys uh, below 16 years old could stay. So women uh, really tried to uh, educate young boys very hard. Uh, and uh, kind of um, implanted them in their heart that they are Florentine, even after they have to leave from Florence, uh, you know, after reaching the age 16, still they felt they are Florentine. Alberti, who was born in Genoa, uh, but he still felt that he was Florentine. Okay, so this Florentine and the identity was very important. So his mother, uh, uh, you know, he, he and his older brother, Carlo, were out of wedlock. And then, uh, but uh, his father recognized these two boys and gave them Alberti name. And mother, uh, their mother died in 1406, uh, there was a plague. And uh, the father quickly moved Carlo and Leon uh, to Venice. And then, you know, they grew up mainly in either Venice or Padua. And uh, father died actually in 1421 uh, uh, when uh, Alberti uh, was just starting his university's uh, career. Okay, so 15, 1451 and 21, during this period, he studied at Gasparino de Barzizza's school in Padua. This was a private school. And, and then um, uh, very much uh, kind of uh, focusing on rhetoric. So, okay, so this is a coat of arms of Alberti family. And this uh, palazzo with tower you know, in the Middle Ages, and you know, Florence had so many towers, uh, uh, but uh, at a certain point, these towers are uh, cut off. But uh, this Alberti clan's tower still exists. This is located near uh, Santa Croce. And then, you know, uh, he studied at, uh, you know, Barzizza's, uh, uh, Gasparini Barzizza's private school. And uh, the, the school was dedicated to uh, kind of a wealthy families, boys. And then, uh, <clears throat> then from uh, Gasparini Barzizza, uh, uh, Leon Battista uh, learned Ciceronian and Quintilian Latin. Uh, Barzizza wrote uh, De Compositione, a manual of rhetoric and style, written around 1420. And uh, he had a lot of citations, mainly from Cicero and Quintilian. He also wrote in around 1417 and 18, vocab Vocabularium, a short etymological dictionary of Latin terms. Alberti was very bookish, and his uh, you know, friend uh, kind of later wrote that Alberti never liked children's games. And then Alberti uh, wrote later in his autobiography that 
He loved letter. He loved learning so much. So that for him, letters seemed like fragrant flowers. So, but at the same time, he says in his autobiography that uh, he was not just bookish, but at the same time, he was good at music, painting, and physical exercises. So in 1421, uh, Gasparino, the Barzitza, uh, moved to Milan to become an orator at the court of Philip Maria Visconti. And it was a time for Alberti to move on to a university. So, but at Barzitza's uh, school, what was happening? Okay, so when uh, he was studying at Barzitza's school, uh, there were great antiquarian discoveries. For example, in 1416, Vitruvius de Architectura was found. And Lucretius de Rerum Natura on the nature of things uh, was found. And Quintilian, a complete text of Quintilian's uh, Instituto Oratoria was found. These were all discovered by Poggio Bracciolini in northern, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the monasteries in Switzerland, in that area. And in 1421, in the cathedral archive at Lodi, a complete text of Cicero's De Oratore on the orator was found. And also Brutus, which is the history of Roman oratory. So these books, particularly Vitruvius, Cicero, Quintilian, these are the most important books for Alberti throughout his life. So Cicero wrote in the Oratore that uh, you know, uh, the you know how to the, the orators should keep in mind uh, these following things. First, they have to think about purpose of oratory and subject and point at issue. So there are three kinds of oratory, forensic, deliberative, pan panegyric, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, dealing with uh, past, future, or present. And there are five divisions of oratoric, oratorical exercise, uh, invention, uh, discovery or concept of arguments, arrangement of arguments, expression or style of arguments, and memorization and delivery follow. But uh, the first three are the most important, uh, particularly for Quintilian. Okay, at the University of Padua, uh, Bologna, I'm sorry. Uh, the University of Bologna, Bologna's uh, law school was the most prestigious institute in Europe to learn civic and canon law. But Alberti uh, probably didn't like to study law. He preferred liberal arts over law, obviously. And for him, it took uh, more than uh, almost seven years to graduate, to get a degree. That was really, really long. And in, you know, while he was staying at Bologna studying, pursuing a law degree, he had a nervous breakdown twice. He writes that it was because he studied too much, but it was probably psychological. He really didn't want to study law. He didn't want to pursue law. But remember, he was an illegitimate son. So he had to support uh, himself. And when uh, his father died, very, very mean uh, uncles really uh, didn't want him to you know, inherit his father's wealth. So uh, Alberti was very poor, actually. So there was no choice that he have to have some job and particularly, you know, stable job. So uh, he eventually got, uh, you know, a law degree. And in Bologna, at the same time, he befriended Cardinal uh, 
Albergati. He was a great humanist, and he was a teacher or mentor of future Pope uh, Nicholas V and uh, Pius II. So these people were uh, in uh, Albergati's household with Alberti, but still they didn't have any title. They were still very, very young. Okay, so in 1428, uh, the, you know, they, uh, Alberti and his brother Carlo visited Florence for the first time because then, you know, um, family uh, was allowed to come back. And then, <clears throat> but at around 1430, uh, his, one of his uncles tried to assassinate Alberti. Uh, it's uh, because it's an inheritance issue. So that was really threat, you know, uh, kind of a heartbreaking uh, because uh, Alberti was very, very proud of his own clan. Anyway, so he uh, had to move to Rome to become uh, a, pap a papal secretary, abbreviator, and then um, he became a priest. Because uh, you know, becoming a priest means that uh, he gets uh, income, steady income. So he worked for um, uh, Pope Martin V, and uh, you know, he kind of uh, followed uh, you know wherever the uh, papacy moves uh, for political reasons. He moved with the papacy, okay, and then um, particularly. When he was uh, in Florence, he befriended both uh, Toscanelli and Brunelleschi. And then um, Vasari says that uh, Toscanelli learned a lot from Brunelleschi. Um, Alberti befriended Toscanelli and to Toscanelli was educated at the University of pa Padua, but probably you know, when Alberti was there, he was too young. So probably they didn't know each other in Padua. But, uh, you know, in Florence, they met. So Alberti witnessed that uh, this university uh, educated doctor and mathematician and astronomer, astrologer working for the, the Florentine government was listening to and learning from Brunelleschi, who was mere an engineer or architect. So there's a class issue between uh, the you know, university educated people and artisans or architects. But you know, because the you know knowledge of engineering was growing so much, so uh, people noticed that that knowledge of engineering was very, very useful and changing the society. So when he visited Florence, Brunelleschi designed, uh, had designed this uh, uh, very elegant, very light construction uh, structure, Ospedale degli Innocenti. And Masaccio was uh, uh, creating this uh, wonderful fresco particularly uh, at the Basilica of Santa Maria del Carmine. Uh, for example, this tribute money um, shows all elements of great paintings. A single perspective, uh, all sorts of movements of people, uh, different colors, and uh, uh, you know, atmospheric perspective. And uh, you know, figures are uh, getting a very subtle light and shadow. These were all later discussed by Alberti in his writing on painting. So for example, look at this uh, uh, <clears throat> St. Peter's very enigmatic facial expression. And uh, you know, the movement and you know, emotional expression were very important for the Florentine art at that time. Uh, this is a famous Ghiberti's uh, uh, scene of 
Isaac with Esau and Jacob from the Gates of Paradise. And of course, Brunelleschi was uh, finishing his huge uh, Cathedral of Florence dome. And you know, when uh, Alberti met Brunelleschi, you know, Alberti was mainly uh, impressed by uh, Brunelleschi's engineering skill because when he wrote uh, uh, De Pittura, Della Pittura uh, on paintings in Italian, uh, and uh, he dedicated it uh, to Brunelleschi because Brunelleschi uh, could read uh, easily in Italian. Later, uh, uh, next year, uh, Alberti translated this uh, Italian treatises into Latin. But first he wrote this treatise in Italian. And uh, at the preface, uh, you know, Alberti praised Brunelleschi saying that uh, his engineering uh, ingenuity surpassed ancient Romans. Okay, so for example, uh, he was, uh, the Brunelleschi was uh, building this dome, but uh, without, you know, much scaffolding. So, you know, only the top part uh, of the dome was, uh, you know, covered with scaffolding. And then, you know, with uh, pulley and uh, all sorts of mechanical systems, um, they, um, uh, Brunelleschi built this dome. That was a, an engineering marvel. And also, uh, Brunelleschi was famous for his uh, single eye perspective experiment. And uh, I don't go into detail, but uh, with the use of mirror and the painting, he figured out how with a single eye, the three dimensional uh, space would look like and how the space looks like uh, being constructed for a single eye. So this is the, uh, the system developed by uh, Brunelleschi and later Rebelti uh, wrote it down. And uh, based on this system, uh, technique. So there are uh, many um, painters developed their uh, three-dimensional uh, depiction on two-dimensional surface. So Masatra, for example, with the assistance of Brunelleschi, drew this very plausible three-dimensional space on a wall in Santa Maria Novella. So this is a system. You can take a look at uh, these slides later. Uh, so I won't go into detail. But there are not only these, um, uh, you know, Brunelleschi uh, and uh, other, you know, artists uh, in Florence flourishing. There are also other, you know, engineers or doctors. Uh, Often doctors were engineers in those days. So, uh, for example, in Padua, there are many doctors slash engineers. Uh, and uh, in Siena, there was a famous engineer who was also civil servant, a Tacola. So the right is his uh, illustrated uh, book about engineering, and left is Brunelleschi's drawings of hoists probably uh, he used these types of hoists for the construction of uh, the Duomo, the Florentine Cathedral's uh, dome. Okay, so this is the kind of a um, modern reconstruction of, you know, his, you know, kind of very simplified scaffolding. You know, scaffolding is not, the, you know, uh, standing from the ground level, but it starts above the drum of the dome. A drum is where you can see oculi, circular windows. Just above that, the, his scaffolding was constructed. So it's very, very economical. Okay, so this uh, engineer Giovanni de Donti was uh, you know, astronomer, doctor, engineer, and he created 
uh, this kind of astronomer, astronomical clock. He was active in uh, Padua. And Giovanni Fontana uh, was a uh, um, contemporary of Alberti. And um, this is about uh, you know, effect of concave mirror. Uh, this is the same Giovanni Fontana about how to make moving images uh, using some lantern-like effect. And this is again Takola. You know, this is about how to raise a sunken column from the bottom of a lake using two barges. In this case, uh, two barges first were filled with a lot of stones, but from the central barge, uh, stones were jetsam. So the central barge will uh, kind of float. And uh, the, uh, the second barge would work as a counterweight. So in this way, uh, they can raise the sunken uh, column of some ancient columns. Uh, and here you can see also um, uh, kind of a diver wearing a, a kind of an air supplying system. So th this era was really, really seriously uh, developing a kind of a how to improve uh, civilian techniques as well as military uh, techniques like uh, fortification. So all these engineers dealt with so many different fields of, <clears throat> of uh, constructions. So this is about how to create um, uh, uh, aqueduct. Okay, so Alberti wrote uh, in his autobiography that, you know, he was moving from bookish life to, uh, to the, you know, to uh, looking for some information uh, which are practiced or could obtain by craftsmen. So he writes, when he, Alberti, heard that some learned person had arrived, he at once tried to get to know him and to learn from whoever it might be anything that he did not know. From craftsmen, architects, shipbuilders, and even from cobblers and tailors, he tried to learn, wishing to acquire any rare and secret knowledge contained in their particular arts. And such knowledge he at once gladly, gladly shared with those of his fellow citizens who were interested. He often pretended ignorance of things in order to better examine the mind, the values, and the knowledge of another. So here, uh, university trained Alberti, bookish Alberti, uh, you know, was not only interested in liberal arts, but he wanted to absorb uh, mechanical arts. So Alberti eventually wrote this uh, uh, book on paintings, and this is a, a manuscript copy. And in, in, uh, in the book, he wrote about a gossamer kind of a frame uh, through which you know, artists could see the object. And uh, from single point perspective technique, he can draw uh, the object very, very carefully, uh, accurately. It's interesting to see that the landscape, landscape on the left, on the you know, nude figures background, it's more like uh, untouched nature. But on the artist side, the background is more uh, controlled. So uh, in uh, his, um, and in his uh, uh, book on paintings, uh, he uh, he wrote that uh, you know he used uh, Cicero's oratorial techniques of inventio, dispositio, elocutio, discovery, uh, arrangement of arguments, and expression. So these are three main uh, uh, techniques that he could apply to describe 
how to construct painting. So, um, so he says that the painting is composed of lines, compositions of lines, and the reception of light. So you can see in this Masaccio's painting, all of these. And he says, history painting is the most important type of painting because in that a variety of composition with various movements in, uh, are, uh, are kind of uh, presented and they are so pleasing to see. Um, <clears throat> but according to Varro, Alberti says, it's not good to have too many people in history painting. Valo said more than nine would be confusing. Anyway, so it's interesting. Uh, uh, some painters carefully avoided uh, the number of figures in a painting, uh, uh, kind of a more than nine. So nine is the maximum, according to Valo. Uh, Varro, and, and, and Alberti followed that uh, with the advice. Uh, <clears throat> Alberti uh, recommended that a painter should know liberal arts and should be, fam should be familiar with the works of poets and the rhetoricians. Uh, so uh, through the art of painting, Alberti was not simply raising the status of painting, but raising the status of different methods of reaching truths. The truths Alberti pursued were mere rational truths, not metaphysical truths that could be reached only by intellect. Yet Alberti was convinced that God's wisdom is unfolded in the empirical world and we should simply celebrate it. And each element of the world which at first sight does not seem to have relationships with one another is actually exquisitely interrelated to other elements proportionally and intricately contributing to the world, whole world's beauty. So for Al Alberti, the, you know, in, in order to understand this world, you have to deal with number, ratio, uh, proportion. So through number, you can grasp uh, the, the structure of the world, the universe. He, this concept reminds us of the concept of world as machine, machina mundi. Bonaventure in the 13th century suggested that without attention to the artifice of machina mundi in, inherent in nature, the mind cannot ascend to God. So for Bonaventure, uh, you know, inquiring the world is the beginning the, you know, the, of the ascend, uh, ascending toward God. But for Alberti, he didn't want to talk about rhetoric. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, he didn't want to talk about metaphysics. He remained in the empirical world. He insisted that we should investigate this world and we find the relationships among elements and we should be pleased. And that's enough for Alberti. So measurement is the most important element uh, for Alberti in order to pursue beauty. Okay, so, so from 38 to mid 40s, uh, he moved around as usual and then uh, he wrote his autobiography and in 1443, eventually uh, the papacy uh, kind of moved back to Rome and he stayed in Rome and then he started focusing on walking around in the city and examining ancient architecture and uh, kind of uh, engineering skills. Uh, so um, then, you know, in 1478, when he met Lionel Deste, 
uh, the, you know, the Marquez of Ferrara probably uh, encouraged him to focus on um, architecture. So uh, Alberti created, uh, you, know, you know, while encount encountering so many artisans, he, he created this uh, self-portrait medal, uh, but his medal is much, much larger than ancient medals and much, much heavier. Uh, so in this way, he is learning from ancient techniques, but he surpasses the, an the ancient Romans. And this is his emblem, uh, you know, uh, winged eye, and uh, um, and quid tum is his motto. What's next? So this symbolizes his uh, kind of a mental condition that he is always a lot. He has to be always a lot, and he wants to figure out uh, more and more about the truth of the world. So uh, while you know, investigating on uh, ancient Roman ruins in the city of Rome, he also excavated, um, he also tried to raise an, an ancient Roman, um, uh, two ancient Roman vessels created by uh, Caligula uh, in Lake, and the, these two vessels were floated uh, by Caligula uh, on Lake Nemi. And uh, probably these were used for some kind of a religious uh, uh, rituals. Uh, uh, Caligula was into the god of Isis, uh, the Egyptian, uh, uh, the goddess. So uh, the historians think that probably these vessels were used for such kind of rituals uh, at Lake Nemi. But eventually, uh, no, he, Alberti was not successful in a kind of a, kind of a raising the, the these two vessels, but uh, you know eventually uh, in, uh, at the time of Mussolini, uh, Italians uh, kind of uh, emptied the lake and uh, uh, figured out the scale of these two vessels. Uh, but uh, even uh, unfortunately, in 1944. Um, these uh, two vessels uh, located in a museum were heavily damaged. So probably uh, in order to raise the vessels, he used this kind of technique, uh, you know, launch from Takola. Okay, so in 1447, uh, uh, he started becoming the advisor of to Pope Nicholas V on architecture and architecture projects. And that he was against rebu rebuilding St. Peter's uh, because he believes that we should respect uh, our ancestors' buildings. So only when the, it is definitely necessary, we can tear down uh, old buildings. But other than that, uh, he wanted to conserve old buildings. So uh, from 47 to 72, he designed so many buildings and he was constantly writing and revising his architecture treatises, De Re Edificatoria, on the arts of building. So meanwhile, uh, he wanted to uh, create a very accurate map of Rome and he was using, uh, you know, uh, uh, this kind of astrolab uh, used by sailors and astronomers uh, for uh, kind of predicting the you know future or kind of connecting the you know uh, uh, your location uh, 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 no deci uh, deciphering your location uh, through uh, the the location of, uh, of the stars in the sky. For example, this was Nicholas Kazanus astrolab. And this person is using Astro to uh, to tell the, the the right moment of starting war. And uh, through the use of Astrolab, uh, this kind of map, accurate map, was drawn. This is called so-called Portland chart, 
uh, this uh, is the, you can see the Turkish, uh, you know, land in the center and uh, uh, Egypt on the bottom left-hand side. And the Red Sea is depicted with really, really vivid red. So uh, with the use of, you know, he has proposed that uh, he uh, decides the center of the city of Rome first, which was the hill Campidoglio, hill of Campidoglio, Capitoline Hill. And from there, he used the, you know, the angle and the distance from the Capitoline Hill. He measured uh, major monuments locations. And uh, Hadrian's, uh, uh, Hadrian, Hadrianic wall, uh, not Hadrian, I'm sorry, uh, the wall. Um, and then, uh, you know, he uh, created a chart. So, uh, you know, modern historian, uh, uh, you know, drew a map based on the numbers um, produced by Alberti. The dark line is um, Alberti's uh, uh, kind of measurement. And light line is the accurate uh, location of uh, Aurelian wall. So, um, so you can see that how uh, close, how accurate Alberti's technique was, measurement was. So this was a kind of a common uh, map in those days. It's, it, it's really not scientific, but uh, you, know, you can see the huge difference between the two. And Alberti later used the same te technique to reproduce statues. So, uh, okay, so going back to architecture, uh, he, the, he, his uh, writings were not uh, uh, depicted uh, with illustrations because uh, he didn't believe that, uh, you know, uh, the illustrations would convey it accurately. Uh, there was a kind of a very ancient tradition of um, a kind of ancient writer saying that. But anyway, so here going back to rhetoric, so Alberti uh, was inspired by, by Vitruvius de Architectura, but uh, you know, his uh, structure of uh, his own book, De Edificatoria, is slightly different. Uh, you know, um, he follows uh, uh, very closely um, Cicero's or Quintilian's uh, structure of invention, arrangement, and expression of style. And, uh, you know, when uh, he wrote about his own architectural treatises, he followed the Cicero's, the oratorics, um, you know, structure of, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of oratory, different kind of techniques throughout his uh, writing. Okay, so invention, the discovery of, or concept is very important for Alberti. Variety of buildings are important. We can uh, learn from ancient, but we can surpass them by creating new types. Materials, uh, you know, architecture should avoid the use of perspective drawings. Only orthogonal drawings like plants and elevations are recommended. So in on painting, he, he uh, recommended the use of perspective to the painters, but architects shouldn't use perspective because, uh, you know, it doesn't show accurate measurements. So orthogonal, uh, drawings like plans and sections and elevations are the tools for architects. So again, you know, we shouldn't tear down existing buildings easily. Uh, you know, uh, we really need a, a variety of buildings as well as a variety of scenes. So the streets in the city shouldn't be straight, should be meandering. Uh, po different political systems should have different building types. Okay, good rural city, tyrant city, or republican city 
they should have all different types of buildings and different types of organizations of these buildings. So, uh, and he uh, declares that he really believes in Quintilian's concept of lucidity, simple, uh, uh, clear argument. And he wants to employ that in his architectural design. So he says that, that there are three components of architectural design, structure, graceful appearance, and beauty. And these three are slightly different from Vitruvian, Vitruvian's three uh, uh, components. And, but, so first you have this main structural concern, and then you add ornament because through this uh, very plain uh, structural com composition, you can achieve beauty anyway. So beauty is, uh, comes from the relationships of all sorts of elements uh, in number. So then, you no, know, why do we need ornament? Because ornament adds character to this beauty because there are so many different types of beauty. You know, he discusses, you know, a uh, certain man likes, you know, slender girls, certain men uh, like um, a, a plump girl. Uh, this is totally today um, a politically incorrect argument. But in this way, he was suggesting that uh, there are many different types of beauty and uh, what type, which beauty we choose is a matter of taste. And so, you know, then, you know, when thinking about composition, um, then you have to think about each element. So you have to divide the buildings into each element, which is called comp compartition. But after, arranging uh, compartition, co, uh, co, co, uh, you know, then you can uh, uh, investigate the relationships among elements in number. Then he writes, every element, everything should be so defined, so exact in its order, number, size, arrangement, and form that every single part of the work will be considered necessary of great comfort and in pleasing harmony with the rest. So once this uh, effect is achieved, uh, then you uh, reach a certain kind of a condition which he uh, calls a concinitus, concinitus, but we will, I'll talk about that soon. But then, you know, he talks about the interior of temples should be dark, interior of temples should be simple. You know, he doesn't like to have overly decorated interior. He doesn't like to have uh, fresco paintings in religious uh, uh, spaces because they distract your mind. And he writes very interesting things. You know, painting is the kind of mother of all art. So writers are like painters. I look at, this is a quote, I look at a good painting with as much pleasure as I take in reading a good story. Both are the work of painters. One paints with words, the other tells the story with his brush. So, okay, so uh, interior of the temp a temple should be dark and because darkness is all inspiring and then uh, fire in a temple no, temple means a church building, by the way. Um, so that in the, in the uh, kind of in the interior of the temple, the, the burning flame would be the most uh, uh, kind of effective uh, ornament. And um, so variety is again, very important. And we recognize uh, the variety in beauty and uh, we recognize beauty innately. And a uh, principal components of composition are number, outline, 
and position. And once number outline and positions are perfectly arranged, arranged, then balance or harmony, which he calls concinitus, would emerge. And concinitus would rule everywhere. So you know, he measures uh, the world to find the concinitus everywhere. Uh, he creates, uh, he tried to create uh, the effect of concinitus through his uh, design as well. And uh, uh, he, uh, as an engineer, Alberti as an engineer, he writes a book about measurements. And of course, you know, a book about architecture is also a, bo a book about engineering. So finally, we look at uh, buildings very, very quickly. So you now we should see how he uh, used uh, rhetorical skills into composition. So this is a Tempio Maltestiano. This is for a Thailand. And, and this uh, is Sismon, a Sismon, Malat, Malatesta. Thailand in Rimini wanted to create a family mausoleum, a mausoleum for his own family and for his courtiers. And uh, he, uh, you can see that you know uh, numerically everywhere is so related with each other, but at the same time he was looking at the context, you know, for what purpose you know you build this uh, kind of mausoleum. Uh, by the way, there is a uh, existing uh, med medieval church, Church of Francesco, inside, and Alberti was asked or, or decided just to cover the, the medieval building with marble in Al Antica, in antique style, new type of building. So he used this arch uh, and uh, uh, picking up the motifs from this uh, Arch of Augustus uh, in nearby. And he picked up this kind of ornamental scheme from San Marco in Venice. He's, he grew up in Venice, so uh, he knew uh, the you know, nooks and crannies of San Marco. And he also uh, uh, created, uh, you know, in order to support the structure, he used uh, you know, uh, aqueduct to support the roof. This is the plan. And uh, this was never finished. Uh, and uh, originally uh, from the, the uh, metal, which was created at the same time, we know that Alberti wanted to place a huge dome the size of uh, the Pantheon. The Pantheon was very important for Alberti. It's so inspiring. Uh, so uh, through this metal, we can tell that, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, final uh, building conditions Alberti was envisioning. By the way, Alberti drew, uh, drew a plan and sections and drawings and he created a model. He didn't himself uh, really use his hands but he created a model. And he sent the model to uh, uh, Malatesta. This is the interior and the interior was also renovated and you can see that interior is so gaudy. And then Alberti really complained that this was not my style. It was too much, on, there was too much ornament. But uh, you know, this was totally new type of construction and uh, artists drew the finesse, engineering finesse at the construction site. And next is Palazzo Lucelli. Uh, uh, Giovanni Rucellai was his very important uh, client. And, uh, you know, uh, in around 1455, uh, 1458, uh, you know, Rucellai asked uh, Belti to create uh, the design for his new palace. At that time, there was Michelozzo's Palazzo Medici, Medici Palace. But when you compare these two, you can see that Alberti's facade is achieving uh, concinitas, uh, that the ref refined uh, kind of a, you know, wholeness. And uh, you can 
detect all sorts of uh, simple ratios of numbers. A lot of squares are used, but uh, you know, uh, building type wise, he looked at uh, Colosseum and for this residential building, uh, he adapted this uh, <clears throat> a theatrical uh, building elevation. So, um, okay, this is uh, the drawing, but uh, so for uh, at this uh, Colosseum, you can see that the uh, uh, Toscan column, Ionic column, column, Corinthian column, these are <clears throat> um, kind of a layered. And then, but uh, Alberti didn't imitate that kind of detail. And uh, he used his own Tuscan and his own uh, version of capital and very simplified Corinthian for his facade. So he was learning from ancient buildings, but he never totally simply imitate them. And then, um, you know, this is the Lodger uh, Ruchelai in front of the palace. And Alberti was, you know, creating this kind of a Lodger. This is the gathering space for the family. And this is a very uh, nice civic space. And at the same time, uh, you know, you can see the scale of the building here. And then through the courtyard, actually you can go to the neighboring church, which was, uh, you know, uh, patronized by, by a rich family, San Pancrazio. And uh, in San Pancrazio on the top, you can see a kind of a rectangular space with a kind of a inner building, uh, which, uh, which was uh, Giovanni Ruchelai's tomb, uh, sepulchre, um, so-called, uh, Alberti designed. So this was uh, the, the sepulchre. And uh, always uh, when designing um, palace, uh, these wealthy people's palace uh, had a, a, um, adjacent church, family church. So, uh, there are, you know, the processional routes, you know, in order to show the wealth and, uh, um, and uh, the beauty of their ceremonial uh, um, percorso, which is a, a ceremonial procession, uh, the, you know, architects have to think about how to create these kind of theatrical ceremonies. So this is a kind of a holy sepulchre in Jerusalem. Alberti, of course, couldn't see, you know, couldn't, you know, visit there, but uh, through some kind of drawings of the, the of, uh, 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 of uh, <clears throat> travelers or from some written um, descriptions, he could create his own version uh, with some local stones and uh, with concept of conkinitas. And Santa Maria Novella, he, you know, when, you know, the Giovanni Ruccioli uh, got the right to design, uh, kind of finish the facade, the bottom uh, one third was uh, already there uh, in Gothic style. And then, you know, uh, upper part was bare. So Alberti did, you know, here combined, you know, he is always combining ancient monuments, building types. Here, you can see on the lower part, um, triumphal arch, upper part, temple facade, and the temple facade and the triumphal arch was connected by these two volutes, which had roof lines of uh, uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> aisle. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, of course, you know, he was conscious of uh, kind of Florentine tradition. So he used the similar vocabulary. And everywhere is perfectly numerically organized. And, uh, you know, in order to, you know, there is a problem. The upper part, the temple facade and uh, uh, arch part, triumphal arch part, you know, 
there's not necessarily um, kind of um, connections in design. So he chose this arch of septimal severs, uh, which has kind of an uninterrupted attic as his source of inspiration. You can see in the middle band, you can see the you know, attic part of septimal severs. And for the scroll, he used Brunelleschi's lantern scroll. So he is combining all sorts of uh, precedents. And for the entrance, he used entrance ent entryway of the Pantheon. By the way, at Santa Maria Novella, there is a, a magnificently uh, kind of a depicted chapel, but this kind of chapel was no no for Alberti. He preferred very simple whitewash, almost whitewash uh, interior, like this uh, uh, chapel of Ruccellai. San Sebastiano, again, numerical consideration is everywhere. And uh, for this, he was combining uh, uh, tombs, some kind of tombs uh, in Villa, uh, um, Via Appia, ancient tombs. And this is the interior, by the way. And uh, he was also uh, combining, you know, uh, kind of um, the arch, the side elevation of the arch he probably saw uh, when traveling in France uh, with uh, Cardinal Albergati in 1432, 1433. And uh, um, this was uh, created as a mausoleum of Gonzaga family. So lower part is mausoleum and upper part is a church. And again, Alberti wanted to have a dome. Alberti was obsessed with dome. And this was uh, Santa, Santissima Annunziata in Florence. And Alberti designed just this circular so-called choir part. And circular choir was surrounded by smaller chapels. And then finally, uh, Sant'Andrea in Mantra. Again, you know, numerical concentration. And here, he superimposed, not juxtaposed, but superimposed the uh, triumphal arch and uh, temple facade. And there's a kind of weird structure above the, the pediment but that's also part of uh, Alberti's design. And uh, yeah, again, he cited uh, you know, ancient Roman techniques. Uh, but here, you know, this is against Alberti's idea of interior. It's too decorative, it's too colorful. It detracts, uh, you know, the, the kind of a prayer's mind uh, from uh, the God. So uh, actually, you know, Alberti died when the just the foundation of the church started. Alberti sent a drawings and model to the Gonzaga family, and then um, somebody else continued. Actually, many many famous artists uh, took over this project. But anyway, so interior was not, you know, uh, according to probably his idea. It's too decorative. By the way, Mantegna uh, painted one chapel, but again, you know, according to you know, following his idea of dark interior of a temple, this church is very, very dark. Uh, and he wanted to have dome, but you know, dome was later uh, uh, completed by you know, Vignola, um, and. Uh, Basically, so uh, for the structure, he was looking at Basilica Maxentius or ba Basilica Constantine. And you can see the similarity between this side aisle and this side aisle. But uh, here, uh, this side aisle uh, is not actually a side aisle, side chapel. And this is probably Alberti's ideal interior of Sant'Andrea. Very, very simple. So, in conclusion, you know, Alberti really, uh, you know, saw that architecture 
was the best way to learn or pursue the truth. But in order to do so, the art of building requires the combination of art of rhetoric and engineering. Thank you. Sorry, it was a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, and I understand if uh, folks won't be able to join for the rest of the Q&A, but we will have a little bit of time for, for some questions from the audience. Um, and uh, Professor Ill, if you could stop sharing your screen, I think that that might still be, um, uh, we'll just turn oh. that off so that we can. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, I, I particularly appreciated this, uh, this focus on measurement and harmony. Um, and I, I think that there are questions from the audience because that, that, that um, stirred towards the sort of more abstract and even metaphysical uh, that so many of us philosophers and theologians um, are, are approaching. But uh, first a question um, from Thomas Dusa. Um, he says that um, Albertini's interest in measurement reminds one of Nicholas of Cusa's interest in the same subject. And I imagine that might be one of the um, points that sort of draws you to sort of bring these two together. Yeah. Now, given that both men were contemporaries, is there any evidence that Albertini was familiar with Albertini. the Adonis's? Yeah. Albert Alberti, Alberti, sorry, thank yeah. you for correcting yeah, me. Yeah. That Alberti's um, uh, was familiar with Cusanus's sort of metro metrological writings or were Nicholas of Cusa's writings too metaphysical for his tastes? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, they share similar ideas, a lot of similar ideas. And uh, today, Cousin's library has Alberti's uh, uh, kind of a book on painting, mm -hmm. uh, later kind of a version, uh, which focuses only on uh, perspective. And uh, un unfortunately, it doesn't have any marginalia by the cardinal, mm. by, by Cusanus. But uh, there are evidences that they borrowed ideas in mm. the, particularly in the 1450s. And I, 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 I can prove that the, at some couple of occasions, they were definitely together at some certain place. But through writings, particularly from mathematical writings, they stole ideas with, you know, from each other without mentioning each other's name. But that was quite common in those days. Mm -hmm. And you change the technical term slightly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but the learned man can detect, oh, you know, Alberti got this idea from our Kazanas or vice versa. Yes. Um, a, a question for me. Uh, so I studied ethics uh, when I was at the University of Chicago. Um, and it's striking this sort of disdain for metaphysics and this, this drive towards the empirical. And uh, I won't be able to say the word uh, that you, you lifted out for harmony. Yeah. Um, that Concinitas. He... Concinitas. I won't even try. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, is there any way in which sort of his, his focus on measurement and empiricism and, and, and this look for harmony informed his, his understanding of sort of morality or particularly social and political ethics? I know you made mention of how political buildings should look within your presentation. Um, but does his sense of harmony at all inform his understanding um, of how humans should live? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, his use of uh, number, you know, kind of measurement and comparison and creating harmony or, or achieving concinitus um, was for our everyday life. And not, not for met metaphysical journey toward God. You know, mm -hmm. according to Alberti, if you know better about this world, you become closer to God because this empirical world is unfolding God's wisdom. So you don't, and uh, you know, you don't have to pursue uh, theology, uh, philosophy. Of course, Alberti knew actually a lot about the philosophy and theology. We know mm -hmm. that. He read, for example, Plotinus. And uh, we, we can prove that, you know, mm -hmm. where he, which part of Plotinus he cited. But he doesn't use them 
uh, you know, very, he, he just uh, vaguely uh, used uh, the concepts. And uh, because he thinks that it's, uh, it's trifle, according to Alberti, to pursue metaphysics. Mm. You know, this concept was shared in 1450s by Lorenzo Valla too. So Lorenzo Valla, Alberti, and Kuzanas, they were, you know, working in the same papal curia. And mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, I think that Kuzanas is more and more proved by Alberti in the 1450s. So mm -hmm. he shifted, Kuzanas shifted from negative theology to more affirmative theology. He never give up, gave up negative theology, but he appreciated more of the empirical knowledge. That's why, you know, the, his uh, book uh, called, uh, entitled The Staticus Experimentis, it's totally an engineer, a book on engineering. Mm. And this book was coupled later, coupled with Vitruvius and read by architects. Although, you know, Kazan's read it as, uh, no, wrote it as a part of a, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of a three uh, part theological writings. It's uh, kind of a <clears throat> idiota three, theory, you know, kind of writings. Uh, part of that is about engineering. Mm -hmm. Well, so then one final question um, yeah. coming from an another member of the Kuzanis Society, Sean Hannon, um, who, uh, and it's a long question, so you can also see it in the Q&A here. Um, but could you say more about the relationship between Brunaschelli's idea of seeing 3D space with a single eye and the Christian mystical idea of an all-seeing eye as emphasized by Nicholas of Cusa's interpretation of the all-seeing eye Veronica image of, of Christ in his Division Dei? And, you know, Sean adds, this latter image was an icon in which uh, the eyes of Christ were painted in such a way that they would gaze directly upon whichever monk happened to be looking at the icon at the time. So a specific question about this relationship between the 3D space with the seeing eye and this mystical idea of the all-seeing eye. Okay, uh, it's interesting. Alberti doesn't want to deal with mystical theology, period. Mm. But he knows about it. So for example, in, in the in a, uh, book on painting, he writes that the vanishing point looks like located in uh, <clears throat> in a, a kind of a very very far point in infinity. It looks like the vanishing point is located in infinity, but actually, it's not located in infinity because, according to Alberti. This world is finite, according to Kazanus too. Hmm. So, uh, but uh, you know, Kazanus talks, of course, about this mystical theology and uh, all seeing I, you know, seeing God is to be seen by God. But for Alberti, he knows all of these discussions, but he remains in the imp empirical world. He he says that uh, it's not our job, it's not my interest to discuss these all-seeing gods kind of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, they, they know each other's background perfectly well, but, uh, but they try to reach the truth or in Kazan's uh, you know, way of thinking God from different paths. So dealing with, you know, for Alberti, you know, dealing with just empirical world, you can reveal, you know, some, uh, you can find out, figure out about God because mm -hmm. God is unfolded in this world. So, but for Kuzanus, you know, uh, Kuzanus is very, very tricky in the 1450s and uh, in the later period. He goes back and forth between em empirical knowledge and uh, mystical theology or metaphysics. Uh, that's the kind of uh, interesting aspect of uh, Kuzanus as philosopher or theologian. 
he, he, his, his uh, metaphysic doesn't ascend constantly. He comes down and go up and comes down or his, his metaphysical movement is horizontal. Mm-hmm. He, there's no concept of ascension toward God in Kazan's, according to my reading. Hmm. Well, I think that is a great place for us to sort of bring this conversation to a conclusion today. And I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of the questions that are out there. Um, but I do just want to remind people again that uh, next week we are going to be continuing this series on Tuesday. Um, with a presentation by Denny Robichaud on Marsilio Fincino and the philosophy of Plato. Um, so please join us again next week. Um, and if out there uh, you appreciate this type of programming and want to support our uh, sort of web programming, feel free to uh, become a supporter today at www.lumenchristi.org/donate. Um, otherwise, please join me um, virtually from wherever you might be one more time in thanking Professor Ilkim for helping us um, see past uh, the edifices and, and to see some of the ideas that were informing um, uh, Alberti's um, architecture and his understanding of art. Thank you once more. Um, you. And have a wonderful, a wonderful week, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.